All right. Well, hello. Have we got the sound on? Yes, we do. Fantastic. Well, hello and welcome to this, uh, this session. I'm Richard Fector and I lead the GHD advisory business globally. We're here today to consider an interplay between public and private sector finance, and particularly to consider the, the role that insurance can influence and support the outcomes as we focus on mitigation, adaptation, and diversity. As you're probably aware, we're talking a lot about the investment needed at COP. Um, by, 20, by 2040, it's estimated that about US dollar 80 trillion is required to be spent on infrastructure. And that's, that's really supporting the changing needs of a growing population and decarbonisation. That covers many forms of infrastructure that we all understand. So things like housing, energy, and communications connectivity. And they're all key in meeting the UN's sustainability development goals. But we are entering a very new and transformative period. And yet it's still very hard to source the right capital for the right projects. Over the next two decades, what that really means for all of us is we need to build about the same stock of existing infrastructure globally again. And this must be a, glo it's a global solution we need because the development world must, the developed world must carry a greater burden, noting that the negative effects of climate change are affecting some of those countries that are least developed and have the lower incomes. How we conceive and deliver resilient infrastructure is a, is a great challenge and it's really too immense for any single government or any single organisation to really fathom. So the interplay between public and private is critical. Insurance is a critical part of this, set, of this challenge because it can enable people taking different risks on projects, helping to unlock finance and the finance risks and supporting fast recovery and restoration where there may have been a disaster. So with that background, I'd like to have some further scene setting and I ask Ying Zhang, the head of climate from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to give us some opening remarks. Okay. Thanks, Richard. And good afternoon, colleagues, uh, friends, and welcome to the AIB Pavilion. Um, it is really um, a very kind of good opportunity, and we are so grateful uh, we have this session to hosted here to discuss a, a point, a discussion, a, a topic that are critically important to us, um, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank as an MDB, multilateral development bank. Um, so AIB was born um, to address the very purpose of filling or helping the, the finan infrastructure financing gap. Um, infrastructure is so crucial, right? From providing the basic services to further lifting our aspirations from thriving, from uh, prosperity, and increasing our uh, quality of life. But however, there are still millions um, of people, especially in the low and middle income countries who are facing the consequences of unreliable electricity and inadequate water and sanitation and very strained um, transport um, networks. The fragility of the, pro of the system, of the infrastructure, can only be further um, um, escalated, um, exacerbated, actually, by the increasing nature um, disaster. So this is really an area that um, motivates the bank to do more. So there are always large numbers in terms of the financing needs and Richard just mentioned, um, but from different sources and different versions, these numbers are always a huge, right? Um, but the, with the common kind of messaging that uh, we really need to scale up our, our actions uh, with the speed. And another point I want to highlight is that AIB was born um, at the same time of Paris Agreement. 
So basically, it is our belief that, yes, infrastructure is our focus area, but we can no longer to do it in a business as a euro fashion. So we have to have you know, this conscious um, consideration or integration of this sustainability um, as the core of the banks as a business. So that's why we said the bank's mission is finance um, infrastructure for tomorrow, which has to be sustainable, which has to be resilient to, um, to the climate change, um, for example. Um, in practice, the bank has set up a very ambitious climate um, and, and target in our corporate strategy, which is to deliver at least the 50% climate finance by 2025. So last year, actually, we are already um, surpassing this target. We achieved 56%. But this is the beginning, right? What is important is we have to maintain this momentum, this high performance going forward. That still requires a lot of effort. And then we also say from the 1st of July this year, all the banks of the financing must be aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. So we integrated this commitment into the every steps of our project cycle from the pipeline building and, and to the uh, due diligence. So we are taking actions, which are a proud of. Um, so for today, and um, we have this great opportunity to have this panel, this distinguished expert, to discuss you know, the key issue, like. Um, scaling up and and also um, to make the infrastructure more resilient. Um, I think we, from our end, we are hopeful in a way that, you know, this is COP. We have built up a lot of political will, and then it seems other ingredients are also kind of on the table. Perhaps not sufficient, but um, the ingredients like a technology, the ingredients like the capital, um, to a certain extent, are there. So then the question is how to mobilize and putting all this together to scale up um, the, the, the actions. Um, and that would involve the dis uh, innovations that would involve perhaps a different type of structures and products. So that's why I'm so happy to have different kind of colleagues with a different backgrounds. You know, um, I'm looking forward to hearing from uh, your insight and your suggestions. Thank you a lot. Thank you, Zing. Now, hopefully you can hear over the noise next door, you know, and, and that process, but if not, then please sing out. Um, I'd like now to introduce the panel that's joining me here on stage, and we want to make this interactive, so we'll go through the introductions. I'll ask for some initial remarks from each of the panellists, but after that, it'd be great if we can then have some dialogue with you on the floor. So please think about your questions. There will be a roving mic, so we can do that. So just going a, a, a around the table here, I'd first like to welcome Veronica Scotty, who's Chair of Public Sector Solutions with Swiss Re. They're an organisation many of us know, but I've enjoyed working with Swiss Re on how we can apply technology and insights to reduce insurable risk. And, and that's both focused at the loss of life as well as the loss of infrastructure. So thank you for joining us. Um, next to, to uh, Veronica is Lewis Downing. He's the CEO of the Global Infrastructure Basel from, um, Foundation coming to us from Switzerland, so welcome. And it's great to know there's a common heritage there. The other plug for GHD is you started your career with us in Melbourne, Australia. Um, we then have Charla Eka Altenkop, thank you, who, who joins as the team leader of engineering at the Turkish Private Development and Investment Bank, TKSB, so thank you. And finally, Rajat Gupta, who's the Chief Financial Officer of Avada, who's a green energy and energy transition firm based in India. So thank you very much. So perhaps starting with you, Veronica, if we can pass the microphone down. How, how does Swiss Re really see that they can help catalyze and deliver resilient infrastructure in a new way? Thanks, Richard, and um, I want to once again thank AIAB for sponsoring this event and, and, and Jan for his uh, introduction. So uh, for those who don't know Swiss Free, uh, our motto is to make the world more resilient, everything we do, and we are uh, one of the largest globally diversified reinsurance companies in the world. 
As it happens, yesterday was our 160th anniversary. So hopefully we've done something good if we could stand, you know, 160 years of changing scenarios and world uh, in which we operate. And, and um, I hope the company will be there again 160 years from now. Um, but but that, that history, the global footprint, and the fact that we work across so many different uh, type of risks and realities, I think um, at least tells me we're well placed to uh, support the development of an inclusive and sustainable growth around the world, which is what we all aspire to see. Um, and in that sense, sustainable infrastructure is the backbone on which everything is built. And so an alignment around this principle of what the sustainable infrastructure is and you know, how do we bring it to bear, and how do we make sure that money flows in that direction is what will build ultimately resilience. So specifically, what is it that we do? Uh, we do uh, four things, uh, and uh, we do them quite proudly, but we look to do them ever more with others. First of all, first of all we, um, we share risks. So we hope that through uh, our ability to be a risk partner and as a provider of contingent capital absorb shock, we can create the conditions under which uh, more can be invested in infrastructure and, um, and creating you know, the development of this market. Just last year, we, con we supported uh, over 12,000 uh, renewable energy projects around the world. That's over 39 million tons of uh, emissions that we have helped avoiding in one year per annum. So you can see that, that you know, it's completely worthwhile for us having that, that expertise and that ability to share in the, in the risks associated with these projects. The second thing that we do is building confidence. And I uh, measure our success in building confidence uh, by the ability of in increasing the amount of capital that goes into infrastructure projects. Um, the second way is by reducing the cost of that capital. And the third way is by demonstrating that by continuously investing in risk management when these projects are operational, we can continue to deliver on those um, economic development objectives. And the third thing is sharing risk insights, which is what you were hinting to uh, before, Richard. As for us, it's clearly uh, at the backbone of how this resilience infrastructure actually come to bear, because we, we, we've had expertise in this area for over 40 years. We have 150, actually, risk engineers that are specialized across different type of infrastructures and technologies. And historically, the way we've done it is to help develop standards uh, for new technologies. So we're behind, for instance, the development of the global standards uh, for offshore wind. And that really helped that market take off um, you know, a couple of decades ago. Um, but more recently, we're trying to take all that know-how and digitalize it and making sure that we can integrate it with information at scale, in, including overlaying it with the risk scenarios. And I know this will resonate with Zhang because it's the climate specialist at AIB. How do we use all the knowledge that we have around future risk scenarios? How do we use the knowledge that we have around biodiversity fragilities, uh, about social impact? How do we integrate all of that in the preparation of the projects to make sure that these dimensions are being factored as the projects are designed so that the sponsor have confidence that those also those benefits will come across not just the production of an electricity but everything else that you know those projects would be uh, intended to to deliver and so um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop here, Richard, but this is what we do. And ever more, we're seeking to do it rather than project by project, partnership through partnership, because we do have to double up the stock uh, to meet the growth needs of the world. And one of the things that we're proud of, we work a lot with multilateral development banks like AIIB. Uh, we appreciate their proximity to the market, their understanding. Uh, of the government needs and planning capabilities. And we're very proud to have helped together with AIB. We were co-founders a year ago at COP27 of the IRENA convened uh, 
set of platform, which is Energy Transition Acceleration Facility. Uh, yesterday, we announced one year in, uh, we've grown from being four partners to 12, and we've now have four billion out of the five billion that we were seeking to secure for resilient infrastructures by 2030. Four billion were already reached uh, yesterday. So together, we're gonna be working really, really intensely to make sure that the pipeline of insurable projects for renewable energy, in this case specifically, exclusively for developing markets, comes to life at much bigger scale. Thanks, Veronica. Maybe we just pass the microphone person at a time. Um, your thoughts, Lewis? Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Pardon me. So uh, I head up a foundation in Switzerland called the Global Infrastructure Basel Foundation. We're not quite as old as Swiss Re, we're only 14 years old. Um, but we, we work um, in, in the space of trying to create some of these partnerships that, that Veronica is speaking about. So I'll pull out just a couple of examples that I think are really, exa uh, really interesting. Um, un under, the, under the heading of infrastructure is immensely complicated. It's extremely complex, it's long term, there's so many different stakeholders in, involved. And the, the only way that we can solve some of these intractable, intractable problems is to get together and work, work together. Um, and some of the intractable problems that I'm, that I'm talking about is, you know, how do you mobilise private finance for resilience? It's a very, it's a simple question, um, but the reality is that a lot of financiers just can't, can't, ac can't break into that, to that space. So one, one example cooperating with, with Swiss Re and the, the European Investment Bank and, and um, some others was there was a huge flood um, a few years ago in Greece which caused about a billion euros worth of damage. Um, and so we, um, with, with some philanthropic funding, um, went and worked with a huge number of stakeholders on the ground to look at what was, this pro what was the problem here and what were the potential solutions? And there was a pipeline of so-called grey infrastructure solutions that were being proposed. Um, and what we, what we managed to do with some of the data insights that Veronica was talking about was then work with the local stakeholders to understand how nature-based solutions could be used to actually address the root causes of, of the issues in a much more sustainable way than just concrete um, and, and, um, and steel. So that, that was a really interesting uh, learning for us and we were able to generate a billion euros worth of investment into nature-based solutions in, in Greece. And now, um, in cooperation with the, with the AIIB, um, we're replicating that process again in Vietnam, in the Mekong Delta, where there's obviously, you know, as, as um, the climate changes and um, fl flood risk increases, um, some very serious problems that, that we can address hopefully with nature-based solutions. So that, that's the first example. The second example um, is the Fast Infra Initiative. So this is an initiative that AIOB and, and Swiss Re and, and actually more than 100 large, very influential um, organisations across the whole infrastructure value chain have contributed to create a label um, to underpin the credi uh, credibly what is sustainable and resilient infrastructure. Um, so GIB is running the secretariat for that initiative, hand in hand with um, Bloomberg, who's running the data repository. Um, and that's an initiative which strategically is, is very, very important for addressing the root causes for the inability of a lot of large, especially institutional investors, to get to get involved in sustainable and resilient infrastructure. So, collecting the data necessary to create a foundation for the establishment of sustainable and resilient infrastructure as an asset class. Um, so, ha happy to talk more about that, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. And Charla. Thank you. Um, also, thank you for inviting us today. It's a pleasure for us to be here with you today. Uh, Industry Development Bank of Turkey, uh, TSKB. TSKB is a financial institution which was established in uh, 1950 by the support of World Bank Group. Uh, now we are a privately owned uh, financial institution operating in uh, Turkey. Uh, 
Um, and also I would like to highlight that our mission is uh, supporting Turkey's sustainable development so that uh, when we look at the entire portfolio, uh, you can see that uh, more than 90% of the portfolio consists of sustainable investments. And we have a good cooperation with AIB. Uh, today, um, I will give you an example uh, about resilient infrastructure investments of TSKB. Um, actually, in STSKB, we finance electricity distribution network investments uh, as an example to resilient infrastructure investments in Turkey. Uh, these investments cover both uh, retrofitting investments and also extension in, uh, investments uh, in the existing uh, electricity distribution uh, systems. Um, on the retrofitting side, uh, the net gain is reducing the energy loss. This is what is important in, in terms of mitigation uh, part of climate finance. Uh, what we believe is uh, by improving the existing system, by implementing those uh, retrofitting investments, we can avoid technical losses and also electricity cuts uh, so that uh, we can uh, provide energy efficiency in the system by uh, applying uh, efficient operating mechanisms. Um, on the extension side, electric and extension side, it is more interesting for us because it is um, totally linked with the Turkey, Turkey's uh, net zero emission goals, uh, which is to be achieved by 2053. Um, regarding that, uh, let me give you some figures, some information related with my country to make you imagine the country conditions. For instance, the Turkey, uh, the electricity production capacity of the Turkey is around 100 gigawatts. Um, this is the sixth largest electricity market of the Europe. Uh, and then also, uh, since we are a developing company, uh, country, uh, we would like to increase the existing uh, electricity uh, production capacity of the country. And the Ministry of uh, Energy, for instance, uh, very recently disclosed its plans uh, regarding that. Uh, the ministry would like to have additional 10 gigawatt wind and 10 gigawatt uh, solar power plant capacity uh, in the existing energy mix of the country. By the way, I would like to say that the more than uh, half of the in, uh, electricity uh, demand is supplied from renewable energy s resources in our country. So that there's an increasing trend in the country. This is why we would like to extend, there's an extension investments in the existing network system. Of course, this is totally linked with the uh, increasing, uh, increasing economical activities and also increasing population of the country as well. So what we are doing uh, here, what is the PPP model, let me say. Uh, let me explain this issue a little bit. Uh, all transmission lines, entire transmission network is uh, owned and operated by a governmental agency, which is TEIH. Uh, and there are more than 20 uh, grid uh, distributions. Uh, this uh, grid distribution system is operated by private sector companies. So the TEIH conduct tenders to extend and also uh, renovate the existing system. Uh, STSKB, we finance to, uh, directly the uh, private sector companies, but the budget is provided by TEIH, by the government, so this is a good uh, PPP project uh, for Turkey. And it is totally in line with the net zero emission goals of the Turkey, as I mentioned, so that uh, that's kind of, in, this is an example of TSKB uh, for a resilient infrastructure finance. Thank you. Thanks, Charla. And uh, I guess in, in completing this round of dialogue, um, uh, Raj, you know, what are your thoughts regarding um, catalyzing more resilient infrastructure? Yeah, hi. Good afternoon to everybody, uh, and thanks for having us here. So just to introduce what Avada Energy is, Avada is one of the largest renewable energy players in India. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's among, it would be among the top five or six players in India. Uh, Avada had started its journey way back in 2011, okay, uh, when the government of India opened up the National Solar Mission 
And in those days, I remember, you know, we used to do the projects, the maximum size of the projects used to be five megawatt, the tariff used to be about 40 cents, the cost of setting power plant used to be three, meg three million dollars per megawatt, right? And today when, you know, Abada was one of the first platforms in India to reach about our one gigawatt, uh, capacity in 2016. So in a journey of five years, we reached one gigawatt, and then we sold our portfolio to another leading power player in the country, which is Tata's, and re-christened ourselves as Avada started in 2017. So in the journey of first five years, when we reached one gigawatt, in the journey of last six years, where we are today at about seven and a half gigawatts of portfolio, out of which about four plus gigawatt is operational. All right. So that's the context of, you know, the pace of solar power projects, or the renewable energy projects in India. And today, those 40 cents, today has the, the, the tariff has come down to three cents, for example, right? And the projects cost, which used to be about, you know, $3 million per megawatt, today has come down to less than half a million dollar. So this is where, you know, uh, Awada being a renewable energy leader in the country has played a very important role in terms of making an affordable and competitive and reliable power available, all right? The other context is that when we started our journey, it was more of setting up utility scale PPAs, selling to the state discounts and the central discounts. And today, uh, more than 20% portfolio is to the private industrial commercial players. And that's where we are now setting up utility scale projects for them, you know. So from an average size or minimum size, which is five megawatt then, today our average size of projects is about 300 megawatts. Last month we won a single project of one gigawatt, you know, which we are going to put up at a single location, for example. So just a context that the enablers which have to provide it, you, you provide infrastructure enablers, and if you create infrastructure, you know, the growth will be there. For example, way back in 96, when the India opened up its telecom sector to private sector, the diligence of India was 0.4, okay? Today, we would be about 75, 80. I'm not very sure on the numbers, okay? So you provide telecom, telephone, people will talk. You provide roads, people will drive. You provide electricity, people will consume. But of course, it has to be just and sustainable. That's my. Thank you. Um, we've got a first chance here to have some questions, perhaps from the floor. Um, so can we get the microphone just across? We got a mic? Yep, thank you. Hey, um, thank you very much. Could I get each of the panelists to pick one climate risk of choice and talk about how you have uh, done something to improve the resilience of a piece of infrastructure that you've invested in or built um, in relation to that climate risk? Thanks. Who wants to go first? Okay, Veronica, can we just pass the karaoke mic down? So thank you for the question. Um, I'll give you the example of what we're doing, what we've done actually, which is I think pretty unique at this point in time. And it's uh, what we call a solar revenue put. Try and break it down and uh, what it is. So um, I mentioned before that we have these analytics and engineering capabilities, right? And part of that uh, includes us having very comprehensive analysis of um, wind speed and solar radiation throughout the year in various parts of the world. So this is climate data that we have. How did we use it to develop covers to help reduce the cost of capital for uh, plants that exist? And this is what we did with the Grand Ridge project in LaSalle uh, County in Illinois. Uh, uh, to give you the sense of the size of the project, that's over 4,000 wind and solar farms uh, globally. So it's one of the largest portfolio in the world that exists, which we uh, insured. And what we did is provide protection for the revenues that is generated from these 4,000 plus um, farms up to 95% as a function of radiation, solar radiation, and or wind speed. What that means is that the investors behind this, these plants know that their revenues are guaranteed. And that means that in whatever climate condition, they're gonna get the revenues expected, so the cost of that capital dramatically drops. 
it's one of the few examples of where this has been done uh, at this point. And we believe that is an important piece of how we can contribute to catalyze more money also throughout the operational phase. I'll give a chance to the others to answer. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'll give a very simple answer. So the, the, the foundation that I run, the GIB Foundation, we assess infrastructure projects against a range of criteria for sustainability and resilience. Um, and the best time, we, we've assessed about f uh, 54 billion USD of CapEx. Um, and the, and the, the best time for us to assess a project um, is before the tender specifications have been written. And one of the questions we ask is, to what future climate change scenario have you built the tender specifications? And in different regions of the world, these have not become regulatory yet, you know, to say that it needs, you need to be suitable for an RCP 4.5 scenario, for example, or whatever scenario it is. So, um, so that, that's a very... Uh, simple example of how we've, just by asking that question, managed to change the tender specifications, for example, for rail projects, such that the um, mechanical specifications will go, instead of up to 40 degrees, will be up to, you know, 47 degrees, because we know within the lifetime of the project, that's the kind of heat, wa you know, heat waves that they'll be expecting. Thank you. Um, I gave an example about the transmission lines, uh, basically. So that in most of the case in my country, the cables are overhead cables. And within those investments, they are taken underground. This is, that means uh, we avoid the adverse impacts of the climate change, especially in terms of uh, extreme weather conditions, because uh, they damage, and then we have electric cuts. This is what we don't want to see in those kinds of investments. And one more thing related with the uh, climate change impacts of those investments is uh, we believe that we, that's obvious. Uh, we support the development of the new uh, renewable energy resources. We support them to integrate to the grid because you need to have a smart grid system to take those electricity. Developing renewable energy is one part of the solution, but this is an important solution as well, resilient infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah, so one thing we try to do is, uh, for our projects, we avoid acquiring, which is agricultural land or cultivatable land, right? I think that's something which is a very last resort, something, you know, which is a patch falling in within our, you know, a Project is that's something different, but I'm saying as a policy, we try to avoid agricultural land so that you know the the local community is not affected. That's one direct way we try to contribute to the uh, climate. The most important thing we try to do is work with the local communities, which is an in in indirect way of contributing to first climate, where we provide work with them on health and education and a lot of sustainable employment in those remote areas, so that the migration of those communities towards cities is avoided and we can create a sustainable infrastructure around those pro you know, projects, localities, and communities, which provides them a long-term sustainable, and you know, that way the preservation of the local uh, you know, environment. That, that's what we try to do. And I'd like to add a, a skill set as well, that um, I think that you know, the way we've delivered projects in the past and built infrastructure, we need to rethink under the new world we're in and the climate change challenge. One of the things that we focused on is building some new skills, and that's combining dynamic simulation that you can now have with, with database solutions, as well as uh, combining the technical with the economic. So doing dynamic simulation and technical economic modeling. So we, we found you can apply that to more resilient solutions in all sorts of ways. So a couple of those have been in developing and optimizing a hydrogen pathway as part of decarbonising, because how you scale um, with the technology risk and the, tech and the cost of technology will, will, will uh, have a decline curve in cost over time. And so how can you work out for the investors the best way to invest? Is it do it all now? Is it building components and scalable models and these things to optimise that as the markets are established? But you can use the same sort of skills in thinking about sustainable logistics and, uh, and how supply chains are different and model for, for climate change or for events like we did in the UK with a combination of both Brexit and, uh, and COVID 
and what that had for supply chain. I don't know what country you come from, but just keeping you know, things on the shelves of Sainsbury's. But even then when you have a, a pandemic or a risk, how can you come up with solutions? So we did the same thing. Um, I'm thinking about um, separation of people in a, in a pandemic situation just to keep the national health system in the UK open. So how can you change the way you operate an asset under a crisis condition differently? So I think the, the real challenge there is, is an innovation solution and mindset rather than relying on standardization, looking backward of things of the past. So hopefully some ideas from the five of us that sort of answer that question. Do we have any other questions on the floor? Or we might just keep chatting amongst ourselves. One back here, Mr. Gitter. Yeah, it's uh, Dr. Gita, actually, Richard. <laughs> Hi, Tej Gita from GHD. So I, I, I'm really interested in this topic and, and sort of the opinions of the panel on this. So resilient infrastructure for sustainable future. And I, I think of the energy system and the energy transition a lot. And to me, that's a whole system of resilient infrastructure that we need to build. And I've heard nature-based solutions. I heard renewables. And I've heard, I mean, there are a lot of things that we need to do. I'm curious. Hopefully it's not an off-base question, but uh, nuclear energy. Is nuclear energy sustainable and part of the solution for this resilient system that we need to build in a sustainable manner? Who would like to grab that curly one first? Yeah. This is a um, potentially loaded question. So uh, from a net zero perspective, from a carbon footprint standpoint, Absolutely, it's very efficient way of producing energy, and it has obviously one of the, the lowest. From a sustainability standpoint, you have to consider the risks of um, any nuclear fallout on the environment, on populations, and uh, what happens with nuclear waste uh, over time. And I think these are the big questions that we have in terms of supporting nuclear energy, which we do do as a company, but very selectively. Uh, and we like to work with, through nuclear pools. We don't like the proliferation of this type of risks in the market uh, where the complexity of the technology is not necessarily fully understood by commercial insurers, for instance. So uh, I think it could be a part of the answer. I do, I do believe there is a space uh, but we find that there are other forms of energy that just have so much less downside risk, personal view. I might just ask a further question, and, and maybe whether it's for Veronica, for yourself, Lewis, but you know, talking through in that first round of, um, of discussions across the panel, there was a piece about how we handle technology risk or change, and you spoke about that, Veronica, and Lewis, you spoke about looking at nature-based solutions rather than concrete. So how does finance and insurance best deal with emerging technology risk or changing technology risk compared to what might have been the financeable or the insurable norm of the past? Um, sure. So when I, when I, um, with my first intervention, I put the emphasis on this uh, point of expertise being made available in a variety of ways. And I gave the example of, uh, of wind farms. And the reason why I did that is because 20 years ago, we had wind farms as a technology that was expensive, complex. By the way, it's, if you go offshore, it becomes exponentially more expensive and complex because you have underwater uh, submarine cables, uh, the points of installation. If there is any damage in the middle of a storm, for instance, it's unsafe for people to go out there, which means dependency of this type of installations, uh, if they get shocked by a natural catastrophe, uh, can be quite heavy. And they tend to be built all very close to each other. They, they, they're farms right out at sea. To, for efficiency, uh, from an efficiency point of view, they have to be located, which is, in technical terms, uh, it's an, a big accumulation risk for insurance. So we worked first with the European Union in developing the standards of what construction material. So I'm talking like hardcore engineering stuff. I think, and, and then those became risk management standards, and we managed to diffuse them within 
uh, the insurance community globally, at this point, you know, those assets are mainstreamed, are still a bit special, but there is actually a lot of capacity available and governments can avail themselves of having such protection available at, with technical expertise and experience that underpins it. The next generation is about green hydrogen, for instance, uh, best battery energy storage to avoid intermittencies. Uh, it's working on the smart grids. So it, these are all technologies that as part of the energy transition and the decarbonization of our economies or EV plants around the world. All of this requires a meeting of the minds on standards and best practices in the execution and in the engineering. And that's where I think as a firm, I know in fact that as a firm, we want to go into because we think it's also our responsibility to help develop those standards. So the cost of funding of such infrastructures 10, 20 years from now is back to, yeah. you know, we see as happened for solar. So apart from uh, technology, which is, you know, evolving, could be evolving, like, you know, we're talking about green molecules today and all those things. But I think uh, considering the intermittency, which is there and a lot of, for example, in India, uh, the, the pump hydro based storage is getting, you know, momentum, right? Okay. And there are a lot of focus, you know, uh, on the hydro projects. All right. So I, I think the one of the most important critical aspects for insurance company is how do we, you know, do a proper risk assessment and coverage of that risk, number one. And secondly, how you bring down the cost of that insurance. You know, I'm saying, uh, just to highlight, I'm saying a couple of months back, we had a major disaster in India where, you know, about a large hydro project in, in, in Sikkim got washed away, you know, it was a cloud burst, right? And it was about a one and a half billion dollars, you know, of the money was lost, for example, right? Where is, how can we further optimize the, the risk assessment and risk coverage of those projects? That's something. And mm. I'm saying, well, on the unrelated subject, but related to the financing is that, how do you provide more efficient insurance for financing purposes? I think what we have seen in the last few years uh, is that the cost of providing insurance for the financing has really gone up, all right? And I'm since, She's here, I would say that the real insurance like Swiss Re, for example, you know, I think they can contribute a lot. We have seen not only the, the financial risk, but even the project risk cost has gone up. You know, the insurance premiums have really gone two-fold, three-folds in India, for example, right? That's something which needs to be looked into. Okay. Lewis, I know you were going to respond perhaps to uh, the nuclear question, but is there something you want to add to the, either, either part of that? Um, yeah, well, f first on the nuclear question, um, thanks for asking. It's obviously an extremely controversial um, point. Um, I can give my view, and I'm coming from an independent non-profit, so I can say exactly what I want. Um, <laughs> so f first I'll say something facetious. Nuclear energy is uh, the best source of energy we can possibly have, and we have a huge nuclear fusion reactors sitting in the middle of our solar system that requires zero maintenance at all. So we should definitely <laughs> use that nuclear reactor. Um, but when it comes to nuclear fission, um, you know, I think it's... When we talk about sustainable and resilient infrastructure, we talk about trade-offs necessarily. Um, and the, the trade-off we're talking about is the damage caused by, um, by unmitigated climate change. Um, versus the potential damage of something going wrong with, with nuclear or, or its waste. Um, and I think something we, we can say for sure is that it doesn't make much sense to build new nuclear reactors or even continue using nuclear reactors in um, areas prone to disaster um, because the risk is very, very high. Um, whether they should be used um, or continue to be used in places uh, with low exposure to, to natural disasters, I think is a more uh, complicated question. And my, my own view is that, yes, they, they form part of the transition mix if we're to address the climate change issue. Um, to talk about the, the technology um, point, m maybe just to bring another dimension into the discussion around procurement, I think procurement practices um, uh, in a lot of geographies, there's a lot that can be done to improve procurement to avoid a situation where a project is designed many, many, 
many, many years um, move on before the, the project comes to construction and technology has improved and what's, what gets built is almost redundant at the point that it gets built. Um, and that's, um, in one sense, it's a very, it's a low hanging fruit just to, to improve those procurement practices, but in practice doing that can be very complex as well. And maybe, you know, the role of national development banks is also important in terms of seeing that um, new technologies can be integrated successfully into tender, tender specifications from the beginning um, and immediately before construction. Perhaps building on that with your response, Charla, I know that uh, where I've seen public-private partnerships be less successful is when they're over-specified. There's a reference design and people price to a reference design. Where they've been really successful is when they have been more outcome focused and you're getting the innovation from the private sector, from consortia coming forward with new solutions readily available to be implemented that might be more flexible, more sustainable and build in future demand into their models. What's your experience on that partnership piece and, uh, and bringing innovation through tendering or technology? Yeah. Uh, for the uh, PPP projects, yes, that is good to have a okay. private sector partner uh, in the club loan, let me say, uh, because otherwise it's sometimes hard to go on with the governmental issues because um, I can say that in my country there are some regulation gaps between the international standards and the Turkish regulation, so that to close gap, uh, those gaps, the all parties of the project should be willing to close the gaps. Uh, at that time, the private sector uh, players uh, are better counterparts uh, in the entire process, I can say that. And about the nuclear, uh, yes, it's in our, uh, it's a part of solution for my country as well. And there are two different uh, nuclear power plants un are under construction in the right now. For the financial side, the government uh, takes all the risks. I don't think that any private uh, financial institution can take the risk. Uh, since we are a, not a national development bank, a, we are a privately owned development bank, it's not in our agenda. But I can say that uh, if, if any financial institution it considers uh, to finance a nuclear energy power plant, I believe that the credit committee, the decision given process takes more than a month, I guess. It's really challenging because you know the um, other aspects of the project, the environmental and social, and it is a, a fact that it's a part of solution. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Now I know we had a question down the front we want to switch back to. Thank you very much. Hello, hi. My name is Rishabh, and I'm from the Green Climate Fund based in Songdo in Korea. And I think my question would switch gears a bit. So if I may proceed, it pertains to climate financing for these projects. And I've written it down. Um, as one of the many avenues in raising finance, I'm curious to know, are you more inclined to raising funds for the implementation of or programming for resilient infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure from the MDBs, or have you considered options of programming with climate finance funds? So my specific question would be, in the larger climate financing model, are MDBs more suited to your, to your needs, or, and where does funds like the Green Climate Fund and ICFI stand in this broad spectrum in discourse of financing? Okay. You want to grab that, Charlotte? Uh -huh, thank you. Um, yes, we work with MDBs, for instance, uh, my example that I gave, we financed with AIB, so thanks to their contribution. And STSKB, we have great partnership with other MDBs as well. Uh, that is the best option for us. But um, I would like to highlight that STSKB, we published a sustainable framework. We, we issued sustainable bonds, and we issued in the uh, last years uh, we issued green bond as well. So uh, when you review our use of proceeds of the framework, you will see that 
it covers, uh, it includes those kind of investments, and we finance resilient infrastructure investments through these uh, bond issues. I can say that. Um, because of the, f if I say something about the climate funds, it's it's not easy for my country to access the loans. I am sure you know the reason. Uh, since we are a developing country, we have some difficulties to access, uh, like climate adaptation fund, for instance. We cannot access them. Uh, but besides this, um, I can announce that uh, we discussed this issue in other panels. Uh, held in this uh, organization, um, STSKB, we st with the help of World Bank Group, with the IBRD, with their uh, great support, uh, we are trying to establish the Turkish Green Fund. And this fund also will focus on the finance, those kind of investments as well. Uh, because as I mentioned, uh, this is, uh, that kind of investments are part of solution. This is the fact that. And everybody would like to uh, invest on the renewable energy technologies because it is easy. You can report the avoided emissions very easily. These are pure mitigation investments. But this time, it is, yes, it is linked with mitigation investment and also this is an adaptation investment. It is really hard to define the net benefits of the investment. But still, we uh, believe that these are, should be financed, and we are trying to uh, define the limits of the investment. For instance, we defined some KPIs to track the performance. Uh, so I just recommend you to follow up our framework. It's covers. Thank you. Any other comments people like to make on that? Or yep. Just a quick one. Um, it sounded like uh, between the lines of your question was an invitation to cooperate. Um, so if that's the case, uh, very happy to have a discussion after this. Yeah. Can, I, can I just build on what Louis just said? So I think the green, and congratulations, I know you got again more, more funding. Um, I think there is um, um, in, in the direction of where uh, Chagla was going, there are two, uh, things that need to happen around infrastructure that we believe will help accelerate the, spe the, the speed at which you know, these projects get approved and get funded. And one, as you I'm sure are, are aware, some element of blended finance mechanisms. Um, there are examples where blended finance has been played in. We can't expect the MDBs to be, uh, you know, just be the only mechanism for blended finance, and not all of them have uh, such a mandate. So that's one area. And of course, you know, if you can be satisfied yourself as to the resilience label, uh, which of which you know, Louis uh, uh, Company uh, Foundation is the depository. There are not too many, but if Thankfully, there are not too many, right? There are a couple around. You can choose which one you want to work with, or maybe both. Um, but it would be one way for, for us to work together. The, the other way is to help develop infrastructure funds that are as, pos as much as possible in currency other than the strongest currencies around the world. And that's because every time a project that is technically solid um, takes place in an emerging market that, that foreign exchange risk of tapping into international market may make or break the viability of the project once operational. It's a really important structural issue uh, which requires a lot of, you know, common thinking. But uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that developing dom domestic markets uh, so that some of the project financing can happen domestically in a match currency is the way forward. I'll give you a moment to think about maybe your last question from the floor and I'll ask one of the panel. One of the topics that came up um, talking through and even that last response was very much about the right people, the right partners, whether it be finance or otherwise. So I'm keen to hear about your thoughts about how you build the partnerships and the collaborations for more resilient or adaptive outcomes. So who would like to take that one? Yep. So I, I think I'll just try to mix up uh, the response to him as well. You know, in our own experience, uh, so, so there are two aspects to the funding. One is the project funding, other is the capital equity funding, you know, for example. So, so first I'll touch upon the equity funding part of it. 
uh, Avada has raised about a $1.8 billion in the last about two and a half years, you know, for the capital, equity capital, and we have raised it from uh, both financial and strategic investors. Uh, we have got PTT, which is a sovereign owned company of Thailand, which owns about 43% in our renewable energy portfolio. They have already contributed about $800 million to us. And there, the thought process of bringing on uh, PTD was that while, from their own perspective, they wanted to uh, decarbonize their, you know, uh, the the the, uh, the fossil fuel footprint. From our perspective, there were the investors who were willing to look at very strategic on a long-term basis, with no time horizons in terms of looking an exit over the next six eight years. They said we are there for the next 20 25 years, and we are there to keep contributing towards your own growth capital. So, for example, when they when they invested in the war in 2021, they initially invested with about 450 million dollars, and today they've already increased their investment to about 800 million dollars. You know, the second thing which we have done is, for example, we have got Brookfields, who has committed a billion dollar investment in the water in the beginning of this year, and that is to our our new initiatives. So for example, on the green molecule, on the model manufacturing, which is in a way of backward and forward integration for us. There, the the thought process was that. Since these businesses are in a new, uh, in an evolving stage, right? Any strategic investor will look them differently, and a financial investor could be happy to put in a risk capital, considering the risk and return uh, profile of those projects. On the project financing side, I'm saying I think, uh, for example, today we have a, we have raised about uh, one and a half billion dollar to two billion dollar debt for our existing projects, and all that debt we have raised is from the domestic institutions, both public as well as private sector in India, all right? While we have worked with multilaterals and MDBs in the past where they have come as, you know, quasi debt and quasi equity investors with us. But a challenge we really face in India is that the renewable energy projects typically from the date of winning the auction till the date of commissioning, about 18 months we have, okay? And the multilateral banks and the, the development institutions, they take very long time in terms of the project appraisal and sanction. That is one issue we face with them. The second issue we face them is that, that we don't find them cost competitive. The cost of raising local financing in terms of INR is much cheaper than you know raising the, uh, the dollar financing from multilats, for example, all right? Thirdly, we get stuck up with the policy framework of the multilats, you know, and the development banks here, for example. For example, we are in touch with AIB, for example, right, and they say that, the renewable energy projects, which we won in auctions with government and state discounts, they can't finance, for example, all right. They, they say that we can't finance more than one third of the project, right? It means we have to bring in either a two or three multilats together, right, which increases the timelines for a financial completion, or we bring in one multilat and domestic financing. In that case, you know, uh, external commercial borrowing guidelines versus, you know, the rupee borrowing guidelines and all those things start playing with us. So, so on the equity side, I think uh, we, we don't see a challenge. There are a lot of investors' interest in terms of investing with us, looking at both sovereign as well as, you know, financial, strategic, right? On the debt side, so far we have not faced challenge. We have been able to raise debt which we require for our projects. But I think the way the, the, the funds requirement is going to go up, okay? We definitely, you know, uh, would need where the development institutions and the MDBs can come in not just as funding the green projects, but providing a refinancing capital so that the, the green projects, where the timelines for financing them is two to three months with us, only in India at least, you know. We can go to the local institutions and the development institutions can take out the operational projects. I think we're, we're pretty close to time, so we may need to just pause. So I thank you for the questions on the floor. Um, and I think what we've heard today from the panel is very much a piece about a time for increased focus, increased standardization of our approaches and risks, and uh, that the there is value in looking at new ways, including nature-based solutions to maybe some old problems. The, uh, one of the consistent messages we've heard throughout COP to date has been a piece about the substantial gap between ambition and action in addressing climate change and the threats that we have on, on infrastructure and livelihoods. And I'll give a shameless plug, as the week before COP, we released what we've called the GHD Sustainability Monitor, and we surveyed 600 executives around the globe about their biggest concerns, and 70% were concerned about that gap. 
and the belief that they could not close that gap themselves and it'll only come from stronger collaboration, as we've heard, and a real partnership approach between government and private capital. And I think what we've heard today, the questions and the answers, very much reinforces that sentiment that there's some new thinking and new ways we need to carry forward. So I trust that there's been some addition to all of our armories of, of ways to combat risk coming from today. So I'd like to thank the panellists who've joined me on stage and particularly thank Swiss Re for organising the event and also for AIB for providing us the hosting of this in their, uh, in their pavilion today. So um, I'd just like to thank Swiss Re, the panel and AIB. Thank you all.